Well, each week a group of insiders joins me to offer perspective on some of the week's top stories. This week we're taking a look back at 2019 and also ahead to how the state's economy, uh, the economic landscape may be shaping up for 2020 as we head into this new year. Joining me this week on the insiders, uh, pleased to be joined by Hollowell Consulting President Jennifer Hollowell. Also, IndiePolitics.org publisher Abdul Hakim Shabazz. I'm pleased to welcome back the director uh, for the Ball State University Center for Business, Mike Hicks. And Mike was our top story this week. Welcome, one and all, to the insiders. Uh, as we look back and also look ahead uh, to the year ahead, and Mike, we touched on this in our top story this week with you. But as you look back on 2019, um, what kind of a year was it? How would you characterize the year for the Indiana economy? Well, I think the best way to think about it is to look back over a, a decade. 2019 capped a decade of economic growth. We've never had that before, mm -hmm. not since we kept records in the 1830s, 1840s. And so here's a period of time that the Indiana economy expanded, added almost a half million uh, new jobs over that time period, really made substantial improvements from the deep recession. Mm -hmm. And so maybe slowing a little bit with an mm -hmm. unemployment rate that's still fabulous. Mm -hmm. And then wage growth, so setting the stage for the future with maybe be some some optimism but some you know warning warning signs maybe as well after a good solid decade yeah a lot of jobs announcements uh, too uh, really for the past several years and Jennifer we were talking about uh, international uh, investment emphasis and others mm -hmm. uh, making substantial investment in job commitments in Indiana yeah the international investment has uh, grown 300 percent in the last two years in Indiana and then talking about job growth advanced manufacturing life sciences and the tech industry with emphasis story started before now but expected to bring in uh, 3,000 jobs by 2023 and then we have all kinds of growth in the tech sector across the state and I think that's really a good story for how uh, how the growth will fold over the next few years and uh, and bring talent to the state as well. Abdul, as you look at the big, your, from your perspective, the big storyline from last year, from 2019. What, I think what was interesting about Indiana was the fact that if you go back, you know, try to piggyback on Mike's thing at the start of the, the decade, you know, the, the, the situation our economy is in just struggling, trying to get back on its feet. Now we have worker shortages mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. literally across the state of Indiana. I mean, when I saw a thing on you know, social media about all these hiring, you know, warehouse workers for like, you know, $20 an hour, mm -hmm. you know, no post-secondary education either because they're just that hurting for uh, for the workforce is even more when you get like Jim would tell you in the, in the tech trade and that skilled workforce, I think to me, that's the, the big economic impact. And what do we do, you know, about all these unfilled positions and the fact that we have so many Hoosiers that just aren't qualified to fill those spots. Yeah, and Mike, transitioning from 2019 to 2020 because workforce will continue to be a big issue. But one thing you mentioned that I really caught my attention is income growth because that's been a huge challenge for Indiana but we've seen some positive uh, uptick in that regard. Right, at least the last few months. Yeah. So the, the, if there's a down story of the last 10 years, it's the, the employment growth has really been concentrated in those low-wage sectors, low-skilled workers. But maybe now we're beginning to see job growth that is accompanied by wage growth, and that sets us up for a better year, less, uh, you know, less stagnant economic growth that accompanies the jobs that we've been mm -hmm. growing. So even if we have a slow growth year in terms of total employment, because we're just out of people, maybe we'll see a little bit better economic growth with that uh, income across the board. Mm -hmm. As we look at those storylines for 2020, I think, and Mike, you mentioned this earlier, talent, Indiana keeping talent, attracting talent here is a big one. Jennifer, I know you work with a lot of tech companies, the tech industry. How's that all shape, shaping up uh, as we get into 2020, quality of life improvements and all the things that communities are doing, trying to make themselves more attractive mm -hmm. to talent? Well, and that's part of where I think the state has to shift some. We've we've become the low tax state. You know, we're great for uh, business. We're we've uh, you know regulation, all those sorts of things. We're in the top. We we're not always getting that. Is the quality of place, the amenities that attract people here? And Abdul mentioned on any given day, you know, there are a couple of thousand tech jobs that are unfilled because we don't have the people to fill them. So we either need to have programs geared toward training people here who can do that, but we also need to recruit people from the coast to fill these jobs. As one element I wanted to ask you about is the creation of the Indiana Destination Development Corporation. Elaine Beadle, former president at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, uh, uh, tapped to uh, to head that up. But this is an effort that's going to focus on tourism, but also telling the Indiana story to try to attract that talent here. That's right. I think part of the focus of it is to make it a destination in lots of ways. And 
up until this point, I don't think any agency or person in the state was responsible for bringing people here outside of tourism, but we need talent here. I mean, the future of the state and to be able to hit our revenue numbers to do the things we need to do in state services, we need bodies. Mm -hmm. And so we're very hopeful that with Elaine leading this new effort and the state kind of rethinking branding and marketing um, beyond just tourism will be really helpful to providing the workforce that we need. Well, you'll slogan speak, it's a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. <laughs> and so I think well, what Ann is going to have to do is say, not only we're a great place to visit, but it's a place where you want to live and you know, relocate your family. I mean, you think about, you know, just look at housing costs, you know, San Francisco, New York City, and how much more your dollar gets you here, you know, in central Indiana, not to mention a little bit the further you go out. So I do think, you know, attracting that talent, saying, hey, not only is Indiana, you know, are, are the people great, it's a great place to live, and your money goes a whole lot further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mike, uh, do you think this is a good, a good approach? We were, we were talking off camera that uh, some other states have kind of cut out the, the kind of the public funding of, of tourism efforts. Uh, this kind of quasi-public, public-private partnership, the way to go in your view? So much like what IEDC was mm -hmm. more than right. a decade ago, this is what other states are looking to. So the the Pure Michigan program is gone. The, the legislature canceled it. The governor vetoed uh, an effort to revive it. And I think they're spending $60 million to tell their story about Michigan. And we're going to spend a million and a half and a lot of private sector dollars do the same thing. And I think it's right. The best important part of this is not going to be attracting more conventions to Indianapolis. We're going to fill these hotels. It's going to be people to hear hearing stories about Indiana that says, yeah, that's a place I could live. Because there's a lot of good in the state, a lot of opportunity for new population growth, mm -hmm. which is the key to the next decade. As you look at regional economies around the state, and Michael, I'll ask you, anybody can jump in on this, but what, what regional economies? Fort Wayne, Northeast Indiana has been a lot of activity in downtown Fort Wayne and that region on the talent side doing a lot of things. Any particular region that impresses you or stands out to you as really getting some things done and poised for growth? Right. I think, well, obviously central Indiana is just sucking up population from around the state. But if you look at the greater Louisville area, now that there's access to uh, that part of Indiana to, to downtown Louisville because of the bridges, the extraordinary amount of uh, regional cities development that's happening in the three regions, Evansville, Fort Wayne, and then uh, the, the North Central area, are really doing very well. I think are, are places that could get to national growth levels over the next decade. Something I've noticed, uh, this is uh, from practicing law, a lot of some of the smaller communities here in Indiana, just about everybody has taken some sort of plan to rehab, to redevelop, to reinvigorate their downtown areas, whether it's uh, you know, Martinsville's, the, mm -hmm. the Terre Haute's of this world, places that used to be sort of boxed and boarded up, are now slowly but surely starting to come back to life. That shows a lot of the state's mayors say, hey, you know, we need that quality of life, once again, like Jen said, to attract that talent, and that's what they're doing by sort of revitalizing and re sort of reinvigorating their downtown areas. Flaherty and Collins, in Indianapolis-based developer, uh, Darren Kittner was on the show earlier uh, in this program and talked about how they're investing uh, the Arbuckle as a $40 million kind of a luxury development in Brownsburg. They're doing projects in Kokomo, in New Albany, in Mishawaka, in places all over the state, and again, really kind of focused on the talent attraction thing, which gets uh, across sectors, but in particular in technology. Yeah, well, and it's important. It's important that they're doing that because we have to create these spaces and we do see because of regional cities and other things that some of these communities are working together more. I think that that is going to be the new trend that we see the state going in that we need this regional collaboration. It doesn't have to end at city limits mm -hmm. because to create the environment that people want to come in and fill the jobs and work in these places, that's the kind of uh, you know coordination that we need to see. It's just starting out the new year 2020, but in terms of the big storyline you think uh, that's going to make headlines in 2020, what would it be? Every time I think about the election, I think about how my home state of Illinois just legalized marijuana. I need to go back home <laughs> because, you know, it's going to be the election. It's going to, it's going to permeate uh, everything. It's, regu it's regulatory policy. It's tax policy. You know, it's our foreign policy. The election, Donald Trump, the president, that's going to be the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Yep. Jennifer. Yeah, I think it is, too. It's going to impact all the issues and the way businesses uh, conduct themselves and what happens in state government. Between us having the vice president and Mayor Pete from South Bend, Indiana is going to be a hot topic and a lot of focus here. We also have congressional races, the attorney That's general's right. race. There's going to be a lot of focus, and it's going to suck up a lot of the oxygen. Yep. Give you the last word, Mike. I agree. Um, the Midwest economy, the states mm -hmm. that were so important in the 2016 election, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, have had the worst growth over the past three years. And so we're going to see some surprising things happen, a lot of presidential attention over the next 12 months here in, in the Midwest. 
Mike Hicks, Jennifer Hollowell, Abdul Hakeem Shabazz, thanks for some great perspective on 2019 and also looking ahead as well. We'll be right back after this.